Well, good afternoon, everybody. We are from a sunny uh, Omaha, Utah beach, which is wonderful. Um, we were worried about the weather today, but the weather is absolutely fantastic. It may get a bit worse later on. We'll see. There's some gray clouds coming, but so far, so good. So I am joined today by my friend, Sean Claxton, who is a few further miles south in La Manche, who's going to talk about the German bunkers. And of course, I've got my regular camera team of Mag and Duncan out there. Mag doing the walking over the bunkers, Duncan climbing in them. And we're going to talk today. Well, sorry. Good, good afternoon, Sean. Are you well? Yeah, fine. Thanks. You and everyone, I hope. Yeah, we're all good. So we're going to talk about a typical German Vida Stonsnest, although I think I would paraphrase that by saying there isn't really a typical German Vida Stonsnest because they vary by terrain, uh, which army the sector is in, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 um, importance of the sector they're defending the materials that are available the distance they are from the main roads the enthusiasm even of the german commander all has a has um something to play in it that's that's correct isn't it sean there isn't really a typical german position no there's an ideal i guess but an ideal yeah, in practice they vary yeah quite a bit but Vida Stons s10 which is where we are is is about the most complete one we have in certainly in, in near the invasion beat there's some others up near Cherbourg that are quite good but um this is uh about two miles north of where the landings were on utah beach and we're going to take you through a walking tour of these various bunkers so maggie's at the front at the moment showing the sea there glorious skies there and duncan is already inside a bunker so i'll put it on duncan's camera there so now duncan is in the area behind i'll, show, I'll bring up a plan first guys so you know where we are I'll show you first uh, this is from a bigot map um pre d-day showing where we are on the coast there so the coast there runs kind of north south and this is a, the allied interpretation of what was here at vida stronsness number 10 with the various arrows and the barbed wire and things indicating what the allies believe was there and i'm now going to show you a plan from the alan chazette book which is kind of the, the 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 standard reference for most of us when we're looking at german bunkers and this is the plan of um Widerstand's nest 10. So currently Mag is standing uh, near the front somewhere about here and Duncan is over here somewhere. We're going to walk you around um, the various bunkers. Now, I'll let Sean talk in a minute, but the, the difference between today and 1944 or 42 when these con uh, constructions began is the trenches between the bunkers have long since gone. The dunes have moved about a bit, as dunes do, and some of the bunkers have fallen apart a bit, partly to do with the Allied bombardments on deed and partly to do with a rather overzealous work by the French farmer whose field they're in, who cleared them away and kind of maybe damaged them. Um, and we haven't got the barbed wire anymore, and we haven't, thankfully, got the minefields anymore. But in terms of what remains in the concrete, most of what was built there is still there. So... What are we looking at there, Sean? That, well, that Duncan's feed there is 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 the middle of one of the positions behind. Yeah, so um, on the sort of southern edge, if you like, there was a series of um, what the Allies called Brooks. So one or two man bunkers um, with either uh, mortars or machine guns, usually um, open top, um, and that's the, uh, the, the um, what do you call it, the, the mount pedestal mount, if you like. Yeah. Uh, for the uh, weapon in there. And they were kind of like close defence, I guess you could call them, you know, um, not very long range, but against anyone uh, trying to attack the position. Um, and then beyond that, barbed wire, mines usually, um, and a few other little nasty bits and pieces, uh, which we'll probably come to in a bit. And then looking back to the north, you've got the, the, the strong point of what we want to call it that itself. So you've got accommodation bunkers, storage bunkers, as well as the various other fighting positions um, for various cannon, uh, other mortars, machine guns, etc. as well. Yeah, and, and the, what we have here is we have both, as, you, as Sean said there, the, the support type uh, built bunkers and also the offensive or defensive bunkers around the front. And notice where Mag is, I'll put on Mag's uh, feed there, Mag, Mag is, is on the, the, the high rising dunes that sit just behind the beach there. And from where Mag is, if Mag pans around back towards where Duncan is, um, we're going to come into those bunkers that Mag is showing later on. We're not quite getting to that point there. Mag's making her way up to the kind of highest point of Vida Strong's Nest 10 so that she can give the view of, of where Duncan is behind. And it may not always be clear, folks, exactly where both of them are at any one time because, but, 
but we'll try and explain where they are on the map. And you can see north there, there's some farm buildings down there. And if Mag, Mag is now by a couple of the Tobruks that, that Sean mentioned there, and Mag can now show, well, there's Duncan, you can see behind in the middle of the shot there in the field, and there's Bentley here as well. as, as well. And um, so Duncan is walking across to these various support bunkers behind. So I'll bring up the plan again. I'll, I'll be using this various times during the day. So Mag is currently um, just about here. On the, there's no contour lines on this map, and there's a couple of Tobruks down there, and Duncan is walking across towards these various um, uh, uh, support buggers. And, and this is a, a French book by Alan Shaz. It's the Someone just asked what the name of the book is. It's the Utah Beach volume of his, of his Atlantic Wall series. So these are sometimes they're a combination of French terminology and German. Um, so Abri would be shelter. Um, and garage obviously is, uh, is an international word, but that's where the folk they go at the moment. So um, a, a typical Wiedersturm's nest, as, as typical as they go, Sean, is defended by, well, let's explain how a company, a, a company of German defenders is set up and what they would have to defend on a sector like this one here in La Manche. Well, for this particular area, the um, it's in the sector of the 709th Division, who... Um, Arrived in Normandy in 1942 and then had added to the 919th Regiment um, in 1943 and then January 44 is when they moved to the west coast of the uh, peninsula. Um, it's not a particularly strong division in terms of manpower and it's not necessarily um, of top quality, shall we say. Um, yeah. And 4th Company, uh, who were in the sector, they actually had four strong points, about four kilometres of beach to cover or to, to defend or, or man. Um, in four strong points, including this one. Um, so here, there's the accommodation bunkers, there's two, there's 10 men each, so that's enough accommodation for 20 men. Um, not very many, assuming that maybe some others were living in temporary accommodation or in the nearby farms. I mean, it's still not a huge amount of personnel. Um, but the idea is that it's kind of self-contained. Um, it's self-supporting, you know, it has enough ammunition for a certain amount of time, enough food, fresh water, and um, it could kind of hold out isolated if necessary um that's nice of the uh um, well, germans the, the today, reason duncan's calling in this one there sorry to interrupt you sean is that there's this lovely sorry. 1943 if you can pan back round again duncan we may lose signal there we did a test in there in a minute and we've muted duncan so you can't see his physical exertion grunts and but that is a 1943 um, when and, and we, we weren't, we're not going to go into too much detail about the various phases of the Atlantic Wall in terms of in 1942 Hitler said that the wall <coughs> should be able to kind of resist against a proper uh, and, and hold against the invasion. Later on, it becomes to more of this. Well, the expression I was reading about today was what they call the crust, cushion, and hammer. The crust being the Atlantic Wall, the, the German defense on the beaches. The cushion being the kind of the, the farmland and marshes and things behind, and the hammer being the German tank. Uh, or armoured uh, counterattacks would come up and quash an invasion. But in terms of what we're doing today, we're explaining what bunkers were and what they did. So there's a 1943, which would be kind of, I suppose, Sean, the middle of this position's construction. They would have begun it in 42 and then 43 and then another splurge of more fortifications in 44 when Rommel gets involved. So, yes, I mean, initially, I think the first positions are actually up on the dunes overlooking the beach and then gradually become more established. You know, they start building things like accommodation and, and, and storage facilities as well. Um, priority being given to some sort of defensive feature, I think, which makes perfect sense. And I think your your comment there about not being very many people here, I think is key because the, the, the fact is the Germans are defending whatever, it have, and measurements, uh, 3,000 miles of defences, whatever you want to call it. They haven't got enough personnel to put uh, everywhere. So they're relying on concrete and weaponry in lieu of personnel because they, so if you've got the right sighted weapons, you don't necessarily need hundreds of men to defend it. You just need two with the right rep weapon that has the right field of fire that has the right ammunition for it. So, you know, it's not about quantity. It's about quality, I suppose, in this case, but anyway, I'll, I'll show, yeah, sorry. Show, sorry. Was, I'll say about a balance. Yeah, you, it's compensation. You can't you, if you can't have sort of top quality troops, then you try and uh, put them at least in sort of uh, easily defendable positions, or you know, relatively, and uh, hopefully that will give them some of the motivation they need to do their job. Yeah, hopefully. So, 
we're, we're, we're starting first with the kind of more boring bunkers behind it, although there's lots of views for this, which is great. We're going to take you to more of the, the kind of the ones that had the guns in them later on. But we're starting with the rear line ones just because that's the way Duncan, has, as we decided Duncan would walk in to the position from the rear and then Mag is at the front there doing the, uh, that view. But um, it, it, a Vida Stone's Nest, um, as you say, self-supporting, barbed wire around it. Um, personnel can live there. There's there's a kitchen on site. There's sometimes there's water uh, source on site. It's meant to be uh, able to kind of operate independently of other forces elsewhere. This particular one has the advantage of this undulating terrain, which I think some of them, you know, as I said earlier, depends where you are on the beaches. Some of the areas are very, very flat. Some are very high. This one has that nice undulating dune. So they've obviously chosen to site some of their weapons higher up to give a field of fire. Duncan's just gone inside one of the bunkers there. Um, because he's inside, the bandwidth is a little bit uh, restricted in there. But you can see um, uh, some of the construction and and uh, the damage here, whether it's from the invasion or whether it's because of the, the farmer uh, post-war is, is a bit debatable. But um, tell us how thick the concrete would be on average in these kinds of positions, because the German being German had categories of thickness, didn't they? And, and we're talking about the B standards for the Vida Stonsdets is what I was reading about. Um, so the, the, what we're talking yeah. for the thicker ones sort of between a meter and two meters. And then you go up to the, the big, like the, the U-boat pens, of, you know, meters and meters of concrete. But these are meant to be able to withstand kind of eight centimeter shells, uh, 500 kilo bombs. That's kind of the, where, what we're talking about, isn't it, Sean? Um, certainly with the, with the larger structures, yeah. I think uh, eight inch shells from, from ships and 500 pound bombs would be kind of expected to, to withstand that. Uh, as we'll probably see in a, uh, in a, in a little while. Yeah. Um, and uh, again, you know, you, you, concrete is a resource and there's not an infinite amount of it. So you have to kind of prioritize. And um, I think it's sort of fairly safe to say that they can put more value on the weaponry than the personnel. Um, so the, at least in this case. So, um, you know, the, 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 the weapons are fairly well protected. Certainly the cannon facing north are very well protected. Yeah. Um, and then of course you've got, you know, the, 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 the ground itself. It's, um, it's not just concrete, you know, you've got kind of sand and stuff on top of it and, uh, and a bit of turf. Yeah, um, yeah, I think those are yeah. Both, both protects and thick. camouflages. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, um, but yeah, some of the, 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 um, the larger casemates for cannon, um, about six foot six or two meters thick would be sort of normal. And bearing in mind concrete, is 2.4 tons a cubic meter. Um, that's a lot of weight and a, and a lot of material, you know, to, to make well, in, in France alone, small... it was 17 million cubic meters of concrete and 1.2 million tons of steel. Suppose, you know, according to the book I read this morning, um, you'd find different figures for that. Um, and also another thing that we could go down the rabbit hole of, of how well concrete is actually mixed in that you can have poor mixes of concrete and bad and good mixes of concrete, depending on the ratio and the quality of the workers building it. This to me, when I've always walked around this position, always seems to be pretty well constructed. Um, some of the later stuff is is when you see we did the gold beach show when you have the block technique rather than the formed concrete is not as good. So this is this is kind of above average in terms of quality, I, I would say, uh, for, for Normandy, um, although there is this damage that exists now, but whether that is from the war or post war is. Yeah. But Duncan's going tight to one another one of the positions now. This is another mortar position here. And. A double a double. Um, double position inside it so it has it has a main weapon and also a defense for that main weapon so duncan's going to crawl inside there now i'll throw up a couple of images while we're we're talking um here is a, a bf69 type fortification which is similar to the one that uh, duncan is going in now which has a main large uh hole and a smaller hole for a, a machine gun and these are sort of standard up and down the coast and Sh sean knows more about this than i do so i'll let sean talk yeah, so um, in the larger hole, um, there was an eight centimeter German mortar. Um, range of about two, just over two kilometers. Um, and then the smaller hole, either for observer or say, or for close defense, as you say. Um, I don't know if you can pick that out, but there are numbers painted around the, the wall there. Oh, you can just see them, yeah. Yeah. Um, as a kind of, you know, guide for aiming. Yeah, this is the, you know we we check this out in, on the recce. There, the, the the there's compass markings there. What's interesting is we we I took my British Army compass and my phone is that they're slightly out now. That either the Germans didn't make that bunker in the, exactly the right place when they built it, or it's shifted over the years. And you know we kind of talked about it and think that with the movement of the dunes, it's probably just shifted a little bit. 
Uh, but there's the W for, for West there. Um, and also the, another interesting thing, Sean, is they had to put some of these details in, in different languages because the German troops defending are not always German. Uh, explain a little bit, Sean, about the, the variety of, of nationalities of the personnel on positions like this. Um, yeah, so uh, you had as well as Germans, you had Volksdeutsche, which could be Polish or Czech uh, or even French, I guess, um, from regions that had been sort of annexed um, by Germany. So, yeah, there's no, no guarantee that German would be your first language or even a language you've ever spoken. Um, the Ospitalian thing, that's a bit different, OK, but with, even within a regular unit, you would not necessarily be surprised to find people who, you know, so whose, whose first language wasn't going to be German. Yeah. And, um, and and Niels is watching and he said on the Tobruks, it was 40 centimetres of concrete. So that's that. But by the Tobruks, they're building them in the earth. So the earth it adds that other level of protection and camouflage so that a shell exploding will be the impact of the earth and then the concrete itself. And uh, yeah, so Duncan is inside that one now. I just pulled up an image there of an eight centimetre mortar. There's a variety of weapons in a position like this. And we, we worked out what you... Just list what you said before you went on live, sort of what Vida Stones S10 had in terms of the variety of, of manu, national, nationality of manufacturers. We have... Um, okay, so, yeah. So there were five, five different cannon, um, two French, uh, two Czech and two German. Uh, sorry, one French, uh, six cannon, five different types. Um, there was a French cannon facing north. There was a, a French cannon facing um, to, the, to the coast. There were two Czech cannon facing to the south. Um, there were two German cannon facing inland and out to sea. Um, there was another cannon in a tank turret, an FT turret on one of the bunkers on, on, up on the dunes. Uh, there were two different types of mortar, the, the German eight centimetre and the French five centimetre. Um, and another tank turret with a French machine gun, uh, from, again, from an FT tank. Um, the Skoda guns that face south uh, were Czech, 4.7 centimetre guns. They had a coaxial machine gun as well, which took the same ammunition as regular German ammunition, I, I believe, German machine guns. But then you would have the German, their personal weapons as well. So, uh, yeah, five cannon, two mortars, two, two, at least two different types of machine gun. And that explains why... About we had to have so much storage behind a position like this because there's all these different types of weapons that you've got to have the ammunition for. And it's not just the weapon, the, the ammunition, of course, it's going to be spare parts, going to be cleaning uh, m manuals, um, uh, the, the, the different type of maintenance. Um, so, you know, that we're not going to go into how effective these positions were. We're going to do on this show, at least we're going to talk about what was here, but you know, when you're, when you're under fire and you've got to run and you've got to get the right ammunition for the right gun and go back. And there's a lot of things to think about in a position like this. And that's, you know, part of the inherent weakness is, is they're recycling all these older weapons that would have otherwise had no use in the earlier models of tanks, the, uh, the captured weaponry, but it is gave, causing a, a huge headache. There's that bit of graffiti in the bunker behind Omaha, where there's the in pencil written at the time where there's all this sort of supply orders coming in. And I mean, imagine, you know, you're some sergeant in charge of all the ammunition coming in. It's, it's a, it's a going to be really complicated to keep a hold of everything and, and, and which you've got the supplies of and which you need more of. And then with each caliber, you have tracer round and rail rounds and a, a different types of shell. And th there's a, a myriad of possibilities, but Mag is now we've lost Duncan Siddiqui. He's going inside a bunker. Mag is now coming up behind one of these two, um, check gun position. So we were saying to Sean before he went live, this bunker has fallen over more than it, ha it had done. It's, it was horizontal originally, but the last couple of years, it's falling more and more backwards into the sand. Um, and now it's really, really leaning over more than it was when I was last there. Um, and so well, Mag will go inside the bunker in a minute and have a look. But th these check weapons, I'll, I'll put up some images and, and I'll let Sean talk about what they were. So um, I'll do the external view first. So for those who don't know what you're, you're not going to be expecting something like that. It looks kind of like um, BB-8 from um, the Star Wars films there, like a little droid there. But it's, the main part of the gun is actually within the bunker with a very short part of the barrel sticking outside. So. Tell us about these guns, Sean, and what their purpose was and, 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 and um, what you know about them. Okay, so it's basically an anti-tank gun. If you leave that image up, you can see the three holes around the little kind of ball and socket thing. So the big hole at the bottom is the main gun, the 4.7 centimetre or 47 millimetre gun, so just under two inch. Um, above that to the right, 
that's the uh, site, uh, right, so that one, that's the site. And then to the left a little bit, you've got the aperture for the coaxial machine gun, a 7.92 millimeter machine gun. And then you've um, got a viewing. Got slight, exactly, a viewing slip um, at a, 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 above that. Um, so yeah, range of four kilometers, um, reasonably potent, I could, uh, I would suggest, um, uh, certainly against the side of um, uh, any allied tank. And facing, of course, um, along the coast rather than out to sea, um, not only are you protected from seaward fire, but all your, for want of a better word, targets are compressed into the little area you're looking at. And if you miss something, you let somebody, something else, you know. Um, and then further south, there's another one facing towards you. So you get a kind of overlap and interlocking um, and inflating fire. So, yeah, that's um, inside. Um, there's not a great deal of room, I don't think, in there once you've got that thing in it. No, but it, of course, it's, I'll, I'll bring up the other image. Yeah. That, uh, when you've got that, you know, the, the racks on the wall and you've got the standing area and you've got the gun itself, there's not much space. And when I take a tour group in there, there's, you know, of seven or eight people, you're struggling for space with the gun in there as well. And the ejected cases coming out, it's going to be very compact. And you can see uh, they said some of the bunkers had ventilation as well. This, this, this type didn't. Um, but the view through the, 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 the port now doesn't look along the beach because the bunker has fallen over backwards. It kind of points up to sea now, up to the sky now. But that, the gun port, you can imagine then above it. Can you show the bit above, Mag, where you can just make out above the opening where it says 3300? Now, unfortunately, this is faded over the years, but above that opening, Mag, above the opening, on the con I don't know how well this is going to show on Zoom. But there's, I can just, because I know what I'm looking for, but there is, the, the first three is just the left, that little kind of rusty bit there. There's a three, a three, a zero, and a zero. And that's going to be meters. Um, and something down the coast there, they would have had in uh, measured out to be 3,000 meters. And we, Sean and I talked and we speculated. It's kind of a little spur of ground that sticks out just north of Vita Stones S5 on Utah Beach. And explain why they would have that marking there, Sean. What it's it's well, it's it's a it's an aid memoir. It's a speed. It's to speed things up, isn't it? Well, exactly, because you, you know exactly how far that point is, and it's easier to judge distance when you know like a fixed point. So if something's halfway between the two, you know it's a bad say um, sixteen hundred and fifty meters or so. You know, so you can um, adjust your fire accordingly, and um, it's like a ready reckoner sort of thing. It just helps yeah. um, when when you're aiming at stuff uh, to know how far away it is and to know instantly. Yeah. And Duncan's on the outside get... the bunker there. And if you pan back the one on the right, the magazine, mm -hmm. Duncan, you'll see that it's got that black surface. And now that, that's probably because the Germans would, would, would put bitumen or something like that over them to basically, it's to dull it down, isn't it, Sean? It's basically to kind of just blend in a bit and stop. Because when this concrete was new, it would be very shiny and, and, and new and, and, and stand out on aerial photos. So, Well, it's, it's basically any, because concrete's a fairly pale, material on aerial photographs it does stand and even when it's old it's, it does stand it does, does tend to stand out quite brightly so of course by putting um paint or bitumen or whatever over it either completely or in a kind of disruptive pattern it does help blend it in with the background a little bit so rather than having these stark white spots on what were at the time of course black and white aerial photographs um you would have um something less um identifiable now now this bunker that duncan's looking at now would have had exactly the same type of gun and what's happened here, Sean, and correct me if I'm wrong, is they had the earlier bunker first, and then they've built a slightly, if like a Mark II version of the bunker that has the protective wall. So they haven't bothered to remove the old one. Oh, he's actually going inside it. He said he wasn't going to do that. <laughs> he's actually going inside it. <coughs> Idiot. Mm -hmm. uh, we do love him. Um, but that would have had the same kind of weapon, exactly, in the, uh, exactly the same weapon, the same ammunition, but there in a slightly better bunker. And you, so that's, that's one of the things I want you to explain, Sean, is when people come and see these bunk sets of the defenses now, they're seeing them as they were left, but they were very much a work in progress, weren't they, Sean? They, the Germans start with something and then they add and they add and they add. So, so that's why you, you get at places like Mayerville and Maisie Battery, you get the first level of stuff, the second level of stuff. So you're seeing both side by side. And clearly with Duncan's view there, you can see how much better constructed that bunker is. Uh, yeah, so um, it, actually, if you go back to your little plan, yeah, um, of, 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 from Suzette's book, the uh, the other one is a VF. Now my German is not very good, but Pestek failed Messig, so it's like a, a strength and field position. That's what the yep. VF stands for. Yeah, and then Regelbauer's yep. that the Regelbauer is like an official designate. It's like um, there was like a catalogue of bunker um, uh, bunkers. Yep. And so that's built to a specific design, rather than just being some sort of you know something fabricated on the spot with whatever they had. 
And that's a good point. So we, we didn't mention that there is essentially a catalogue of German bunkers, and then they choose from the catalogue the one they need based on location, importance of the coast, what it's got to do, and they pick them from the catalogue. And yeah, you've got the field fortifications, and then you've got the, the, the regular proper um, improved ones with the, with the increased protection by the blast wall there. I don't know who's there now. If Duncan's out there, but if you go around, one of you go around the front and show the blast wall <laughs> from the front, and you've got that big steel lintel as well above the opening, which helps. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that just if, if one of you can go back and show both bunkers side by side, but as Mag's around the front, Duncan, if you go backwards, back towards where you and show both bunkers <clears> side by side, the viewers will get an idea of the improvement from the the Mark One on the left. If you, I'm, I'm using my own terminology and the Mark II on the right, and you can clearly see there an improvement. Look at the thickness of the concrete on the right. Look at the uh, the, the the blast wall. If you pan around a little bit, well, Mag's got it, actually. I use Mag's image. Look at the thickness of that blast wall there that Mag has got compared to the wall over on the left there. It's a good foot and a half thicker, would you say, Sean? Yeah, certainly bigger. And the other thing, if you look at it, it's actually part of the structure. Yeah. Whereas on the older bunker, it's in addition. So you have what you call a cold joint. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons that when you're pouring concrete, you want to do it in a, basically in one go. Otherwise, you, you end up with the, the cold joint, and that's like a natural gap, which will be exploited. And as you can see, the erosion over the years has certainly done well with the, with the other one. Um, and Duncan's got that split there. That's yeah. where that one has collapsed. And I, th I think that's what you're saying there, Sean, is that wall wasn't part of it, and it's just broken away. It's just... um. It's you know, age and weather and sea air and salt water has just got in there and cracked it. But um, th 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 that this evolution of the German defense is something I think we don't talk about quite enough. And um, look, then while we've got that view there, because um, Duncan likes his spang, that's where it's been hit. Now, someone just asked, David Me just asked where we are. We're a couple of miles north of Utah Beach. So this area was attacked a couple of days after D-Day. And this 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 gunfire here is not going to be from June the 6th, is it, Sean? That's going to be from uh, the push. Oh, well, it, it depends. Well, it could um, be. It could I, be both, it, yeah. It, but. It could, well, it, it was attacked. The site was attacked. It's the job of the 3rd Battalion, 22nd Infantry, to kind of clear the coast. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Lieutenant Colonel Teague. And they had a platoon of uh, M-Force from A Company 746 Tank Battalion. Um, and uh, when they got, well, they weren't able to clear this particular strong point. Um, um, so that, that's either their efforts, unsuccessful efforts to clear it, or it's just guys going in later on and just making sure. Um, the German garrison themselves basically evacuated um, after dark um, further to the north. Um, but yeah, it was never um, taken in the traditional sense, if you like. Uh, it had been abandoned by the time they, uh, um, they took it. And Manga's got one of the but hits on the front there. Now that that's the seaward side of the of the bunker there. Now that is going to be almost certainly from June the sixth, whether that's from a a destroyer or a light crew, who you know, who it's impossible to say. But I mean, although to be fair, we're not going to go down the the path of talking about particularly what happened in terms of the invasion. We're here to talk about the Atlantic Wall and what the Germans did. But you know, we will there, we will point out the damage as we go past things. But it is it is kind of it is kind of cool there. So. Duncan's on the roof of the bunker now. So I'll just show the image there. So we've got a chimney there, which is, you know, don't need to explain to you what a chimney is. That's the fairly self-expansion. But you can see, I think, the quality of the concrete there. Now, bearing in mind, folks, this has been sitting here now for about 78 years, this bunker. And if anyone who's ever been to Normandy in the winter, it takes a hammering from that coast there. In fact, there's actually a storm predicted possibly later today. Um, the fact this concrete is all still here, I think, is testament, or, or most of it's still here, to how well the job the Germans did generally building this stuff. In that, I, you know, there, there are American built bunkers in San Francisco Bay and things like that that are already falling apart. This stuff is made well, isn't it, Sean? And it's, you know, it's the cliche, but it is when the Germans put their mind to engineering, they did do a good job, didn't they, Sean? And, and this, well, explain a little bit about the organization that, that was behind the manufacture of the Atlantic Wall, just the, you know, layman's basic introduction. Okay, so yeah, so you had the organization responsible for construction. Um, you had um, German construction units. Um, uh, you had... Uh, RAD personnel, so you basically your, your national service after the Hitler Youth before you joined the army, you had personnel from that unit. Um, there was a like a headquarters in Cherbourg, which looked after the Cotonton, or most of the, if not all the Cotonton. Um, and then uh, forced labour. 
um, from the local population, the STO, the Servicio de Vable So um, I think it's early 1943, between 16 and 60 years of age, um, you become eligible for um, service. Um, and not necessarily doing more, more, more the civil civil engineering side of things rather than um, handling munitions and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, you had, I think, something like 290,000 laborers in France at the time um, working for the Germans. Um, either willingly or otherwise. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, and I just, I fact photo that same location taken a couple of days or so after D-Day with a Jeep in front of it, just showing you where we are so you can, you know, get, doing your own research into these things. So we're starting to make our way along towards the, to the north. So Mag's going to work her way along the beach, showing the view up to the bunkers. And don't go too fast, folks, because we want to, you know, guys, because we want to stop and talk about things. And Duncan's going to work his way along the top. And then we'll introduce each bunker as we come to it. So, so Duncan is in a, if anyone's been to Normandy, you've seen loads of these, because this is one of the most standard types of fortifications you get along the coast. So Sean, what's Duncan inside now? Um, it's basically a ring stand or um, a circular pit for a five centimeter gun. If you've been to Pegasus Bridge, there's one there. Um, there's, there's, well, there's, yeah, you said, you're right. There's, there's a lot of them. So, I say obsolete vehicles, obsolete tanks, um, their guns are removed. So there's a five, that's what it looked like at the time. So you have a five centimeter gun. Um, this one's got a muzzle brake, but the longer one was fitted to a Panzer III. Um, Panzer III by now was more or less obsolete. So the, the weaponry serves a newly or gains a new lease of life uh, inside these um, inside these structures. So you've got 360 degree traverse, you've got the little kind of alcoves there for ammunition. Um, uh, it would have been a little bit lower than that, I think, at the time. But um, yeah, um, and uh, it's, I think that was actually one of the first things I built here, these, these things along the dunes there, at this particular site, um, yeah. just to, you know, for some protection for the coast. Well, it makes sense because if when you've stood there, that's kind of the first place anyone would put one, isn't it? It's just the obvious look out to sea, views left. You and if you can pan around a bit left and right, Mag uh, Duncan, so you can see it, you know, it, and and also right round behind. Let's get Sean just said it there. From there, you have got a three sixty. You can fire um, right, and you better reach well to the those houses, well to the road beyond. You you'd pretty much be able to reach the high ground on the uh, in. Let's what's the range of that about? Two miles, Sean. Yeah. Hang on. <laughs> I, so, uh, I mean, we're, we're putting uh, short, I think yeah, it's, it's about two kilometers. So um, yeah, so uh, so pretty much everything miles. you can see as Duncan pans round, pretty much within the range of that. And it, you know, it's that's why it's on that little hot bit of high ground there. So that's the view south there. So low, over in the background, way over the other side of the estuary is Point du Hoc and Omaha Beach, or about fifteen miles away. Mag is on the beach. I'll just get while it's there, looking so nice. There's Mag's view of the. The wonderful light we've got today, the lovely clouds, and the, and it's about half tide. But um, so the, the five centimeter pack guns, they, I mean, there are thousands of those built on Atlantic Wall, weren't there? I mean, just <laughs> you, you can't, and we, we haven't said already, in this part of Normandy, there's a Vida Stones desk roughly every half a mile or so, isn't there? Ish. Um, yeah, I would say you've got this this one company covering four kilometers and there's four strong points. So, yeah, it's one, yeah, one every kilometer, kilometer to a kilometer or so between them. And it depends yeah. on the yeah. importance of the coast and what have you. And then they're going to Duncan's going to carry on working his way north and, um, you know, explaining what we come to as we go along. So carry on. Mag will do the view from the bottom. So carry on. Don't Bentley lead the way. So the next one we're coming to now has been filled in with concrete for whatever reason at some point i don't know when in its history and it looks a bit kind of pathetic standing there now it doesn't look very exciting but that that tell us about that type sean okay so um this is what we mentioned earlier it's got a nice drink bowl for bentley but um it's uh it had on it a turret from a, a first world war french ft tank um which the germans captured large numbers of in uh, in 1940 um so there you go um, this particular one as in the picture has a 3.7 centimeter or 37 millimeter gun um it's a two-man tank so it had a one-man turret and a, and a driver so basically one guy in theory could, could operate that um I had racks for ammunition and so on um, and it just gives them a little bit more protection than the open to Brooks we saw earlier on. Because it's a tank turret, it's armoured. Although it's only relatively thin armour, it's still, you know, some modicum of protection. There you yeah, go. That's if nice if you're running up a beach with just your GI shirt and your leather boots to protect you, it's 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 uh, it's, you oh, know, it's, yeah, it's yeah. formidable, isn't it? It may not be formidable oh, yeah, compared to a Tiger tank or a Panther, but, you know, in terms of what we're looking at. And you can see over the years, these have all filled in with earth and the dunes have moved around and what have you. But... 
yeah, there's, I reckon for that, I mean, a lot of people watching this have been to this location. So it's Les Dunes de Varaville is where we are, folks. And you can just, you can't miss it because there's a Sherman tank and an M8 armored car parked there in of General Leclerc and the uh, the French Second Armored Division. But we're at, the, we're at the location simply to talk about German concrete today. And I'll just put on Mag's view for a second because notice as well from where, now the light is a bit odd, but apart from the big bunker that's obviously there in the center right of the shot there, if you pan around to the left a bit more, Mag, the left of the, the dunes, from the beach there, you can't really see the, they're, they're very well hidden, some of them, aren't they? Uh, the Germans have built them into the earth, both for protection as we established earlier, but also for camouflage, if if you know if there's you're landing there, you you've you've maybe seen the bigot map, and until you come under fire, you're not necessarily sure exactly where that where that tank turret is going to be. But anyway, Duncan's carrying along down the uh, the the, the drones there. So the next one we're going to come to is another another type. So um, he'll be there in a minute, and with looks like there is some grey clouds up there ahead. So hopefully we'll get done before the rain comes in. So. And I'll put Mag. So Mag, if you can follow Duncan along, because I want to get the view from underneath where Duncan is now, because there's a really nice view. Because that one's really sort of standing, um, kind of quite high on the on the dune, going against what I just said. But um, so where where are we now? What are we at now, Sean? Slightly different, similar but slightly different, isn't it? Yeah, you had another uh, FT turret um, uh, up in the dunes there. This time with a machine gun. Um, so almost identical, but instead of having the little cannon, had a had a had a French machine gun. And it was very um, difficult to but, find well, photos yeah, of this particular type of French machine. I have got a couple. Here's one. Um, Sean will correct me if I'm wrong. That's from a street somewhere in Biarritz with a rather comical looking German there. But I believe is that the type of weapon shot? I think it is. Um, I don't know. Niels will probably actually chip in. It looks like it from the magazine. Yeah. Yeah. So I believe it is. Um, and that's a, lot, a rather curious photo there. But. Um, that's the type of weapon we're talking about, a French. And again, it reminding us about this use of multiple different types of weaponry. There's the type of, it's got a very sight, weird sight. It looks like kind of a cine camera, that machine gun. It's, it's, it's not, you can look at it. You don't need to know much about machine guns. Brian Yee is watching this to know that's not state of the art by 1944, but it still flings bullets out um, at a rate of knots. Yeah. And if you're coming up against that, it's not fun to be under fire from. So yeah, it's less of an issue if you're on the beach, certainly. Exactly, yeah, and that's why the Germans are getting on with these, with these, um, th this kind of weapon. They've got them. They might as well use them somewhere. They've got ammunition. Put them in these positions. And as we said, you know, said earlier, this with this idea, the Atlantic Wall isn't necessarily meant to stop the invasion. It's meant to just delay it long enough to bring up reinforcements. So a, a French machine gun, a rebel there is going to be enough. So. Um, and there's slots there for the storage of ammunition. The magazine would sort of slide out on trays and you can grab an extra one. And when you go there, I mean, Duncan and me are kind of modern sized 21st century guys. You imagine when there was two or three people getting inside these bunkers, they they clearly were a bit smaller than we are these days because there's not a lot of room in these things. Um, but yeah, that's where the ammunition was stored. And I'll put on Mag's view again. So there's the bunker from, from the, the beach view. So you can see how it's been dug out, built into the sand there, and then they pushed the dunes, and the dunes, you know, grown around it again to give it that blast protection. And Duncan, Duncan has climbed out again. You can almost hear the hear the the, the uh, there. So let's move along, Duncan. When you pick up the camera, you're doing sterling job, folks. Uh, well done. You're doing really well because we're getting getting to kind of going to get to the exciting one soon. Um, the big the big bunker, and um. Yeah, I'm surprised how people are watching this. It's uh, clearly clearly German bunkers uh, is a is a is a hot topic. So that's good. We'll do more of these, and if people like them, so um, and and also, folks, there are positions near here that are on private ground. Indeed, a couple of the bunkers within this position are in private ground. But all what we're doing today is all perfectly okay to access. It's all um, public ground. There's pathways to it, um, and I do say, you know, if you're coming to normally be be respectful for people's property and what have you. Uh, but this is why it's a very good one to visit. You've got everything you need pretty much in one position. It's there to visit. You can walk among them. You can take your photos and you've got a parking area beside it as well. So perfect. So coming up to another, another very similar one. So um, um, this was uh, another machine gun, another, another, I think another yeah. French machine gun, another rebel. Is that right, Sean? According to my plan. I think so, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. But, 
the other thing, of course, is don't forget some of those rear line positions that had also have a Tobruk. That might have been an MG34. So as, we, as Sean said earlier, you know, you've got cases of MG34 ammunition, you've got cases of the ammunition for the French weapons, you've got cases of the, 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 the Czech 4.7s. There's a lot of, lot of headaches uh, to, to deal with there. Um, and Mag is already a, ahead of the next bunker, but we'll wait for, for, for Duncan to catch up. But we'll, that's, that's the view you would have said. Hold that view there from the sea, Mag. That's really good. That's 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 what you see from the from the uh, the coast, and there completely gets across Sean's comment earlier of having the guns enfilading. You are doing two things by having your guns fire sideways. You are firing at a reduced target along gr ground, so your gun is firing. That view Mag is holding that there. That's kind of the view the gun would have, although we'll go inside the bunker soon. So a narrow degrees left and right. But also, you've got that bloody great wall of concrete facing the sea. And as Mag goes up, um, you'll see that it has taken some hits. Um, we'll do the ones, that, not that one the right foot. We'll do that in a minute, Mag. We'll do the ones on the left, the, big, the ones facing you. Yeah, that's the ones. That's naval hits. And people have looked at that and said that it looks like something eight centimeters hit that. And there were cruisers like the Quincy was in the area there. That's probably eight centimeter hits. And they have penetrated barely six inches in what is about five foot of concrete there. So there, folks, is what happens when you fire naval shells at these larger bunkers. They essentially bounce off. Although the guy inside, I think, would have a guy that would have a bit of a headache, but Look at the foundations. I saw explain how the one of the weakness these days is the foundations because they're, you know, they're building directly on sands. If Mag, if you pan down a bit, the base of the bunker, what what's yeah. happening there, Sean? Is of course the sea is just washing out the foundations, isn't it? Yeah, the sea, the wind, the sands going away, and uh, with nothing underneath it, it will one day <laughs> um, come down. Um, you can see what I was talking earlier about the cold joints, you know, the gap between the, the layer of the foundation layer and the bunker itself, you know, so yeah. you have like a natural gap, which nature was kind of exploiting. You yeah, nature's getting cancer, in the gap, which isn't it? Yeah. Ancient rebar inside the bunker causing cracks as well. And um, they have a lifespan like all of us and uh, not necessarily in our lifetime, but one day that will uh, well, well, that's another subject for the day is whether or not we ever make an attempt to try and preserve these positions or whether we let them fade away. And, you know, they, they are they represent the German occupation of France, but they are also interesting. I mean, it's well, we won't get into that the conversation today, but there is a there is a, a, a thought about whether or not we should make a move to re restore them and pr preserve them. But um, I'll put on Duncan's feed now because Duncan's now on the uh, the south facing side of the bunker. And that, again, is going to be hits probably from the force coming up. There were about three the three Sherman tanks of the uh, 761st? 46th. 46th, that's right. 46th. Um, coming up. Um, and in fact, if you show the one with a bit of shell inside it, Duncan, that's kind of a cool one. There's one on the right, that just to the right, Duncan, has got a bit of the, of the shell inside. There we are. Above the air ventilation bit there, there's actually a part of the incoming shell still embedded in the wall there, which is rather neat. Um, but again, hasn't really penetrated very far. Mag's on the way. Well, while Mag's there, that is a 76 or 75 millimeter shell. Uh, but if, if you, if can you show the trajectory that shell would have come from, Mag? Turn around and face exactly away from that hole, if you don't mind. So get... Because you'll see that that shell there can't have possibly have come from the sea. If you turn exactly 180 degrees round, Mag, so you're facing behind you. Basically, I want to get across the fact that whoever did that was coming up the beach or across the dunes. And it probably, well, it, we, we know it was a Sherman tank, don't we, Sean? I mean, there's no probably about it. It was a Sherman it's tank coming up. But that that there that and that we don't whether yeah does that the Sherman would have been coming up the beach or across the dunes there some sometime after D Day and hit that bunker there and again didn't penetrate very far and I'll put it back on Duncan's shot again and then we'll have Duncan going so there's there's various hits on this um, and you can see the bits of stones and, and and rubble and stuff that have been used to make this a couple of um, uh, AP rounds there from um, from from rifles or machine gun or something on there as well but. We got a question a minute ago saying, um, did I say eight centimeter there a minute ago? Yeah, I did. I meant eight inch, didn't I? Yeah. So Duncan's going inside. Well, before we go inside, look at the, there, there's a door there. There would have been a door, Sean. Uh, yeah. Uh, you can see the hinges, um, uh, which gives you some idea about the size of the door as well. 
Um, it's not a small thing. Um, so doors to protect it at the back. And then uh, if we look inside, you, have, you can see the, the view perfectly straight down the beach. Yeah. Yeah. And that would have been, I'll show the, the model of, of, of weapon that was in there. I'll give the photo up. We think it was one of these. Um, which looks a little bit antiquated with the kind of the old kind of carriage wheel kind of wheels there. But and it is an obsolete gun in terms of field use. But in terms of what it's doing here, it's perfectly good at doing what it does down there. Um, a 7.5 centimeter gun. Um, and if that I'll put it back on. There's the recesses there for ammunition and supplies and there'd have been ventilation and you've got a reinforced uh, steel roof there. And mag is on the front of the bunk. I'll put on mag's view for a second. So there's what you see from the uh, from the um, from the beach there. It's got some, some graffiti these days. And again, you can see that what Sean was saying about the cold joint there, in that the, the foundation has completely broken away because that's two separate bits of concrete from two separate phases of construction. And nature has just just split it. Um, I'll put on Duncan's view again now. So there's the view down the coast, and it, it's a bit hazy, but over there directly ahead. Beyond that bit of um, the uh, Gooseberry Harbour there, that's sitting beyond those two people, it's hard to see on the zoom image there, but it's San Vala O, which is like a spur of ground that runs around. And uh, I did some calculations. Uh, that's that that gun there, which can fire about, what, about eight miles, Sean? Ish? Yeah, about that. Yeah, seven or eight miles, yeah. It covers 17 miles of coastline because of the curve of the bay. Um, right. <laughs> but, but only at about 20 degrees. It's all within within a very nice, comfortable turn. There's some German graffiti there, and uh, I that there's been graffitied over the top of there. But um, I'll let Sean say it there because he's better at German than I am. Well, it used to say "Yeah, it's like Feuerbereit." This is like the old times, ready to fire. I think it would be a rough translation of that. Um, the modern stuff, I have no idea what it says. There was a Bart Simpson on there a few years. Ago. That's gone now. But yeah. Okay. Always time ready to fire. Every always ready to fire. Every, every, yeah, always, something like that. Something kind of, of the uh, ready to fire nature. But there is still there's an entire Heimdall book of German graffiti inside bunkers that you can actually buy. And and you know we've seen some of the markings on the mortar ones. And here have got a bit of graffiti there. But just again, Duncan, Duncan, put it on that view down the coast there, just so we get an idea of just how incredibly well set up this uh, this um, bunker was and how thick that concrete is. And there's Mag's view on the front again. So, um, yeah, the, the talk about the um, uh, how some of these guns were actually put inside. Then the steel door goes on. Then they'd be very difficult to get out. Some bunkers are actually built around the gun, weren't they? You can't even get out of a new the old gun to replace it with a newer model. Uh, no, I mean that certainly the case in the. Um... Uh, the coastal batteries that was the case you know the yeah. gun would be so it would be practical to move it inside in one piece anyway um but yeah i mean the, the idea is it's it's, it's there for um, for the long term anyway yeah you know and, and it, it, it does a job as you say it might be obsolete it might not be top you know um brand new uh, top quality stuff but it can still fire a shell um seven or eight miles up the coast with a really fairly regular basis as well you know and while duncan's got that view sean explain what the group that the track grooves are on the floor there Oh, you got like um, for the trails um, to stop uh, or reduce recoil um, of, of the of the, uh, the carriage of the gun when it fires. So they were kind of lock into that, and so when it fired, it wouldn't shift back too much because you're in a confined space, of course. So you wouldn't want a thing rolling around too much inside. We're quite fragile as people, and um, that isn't. So um, you know anything you could do to stabilise it would uh, would be a benefit. And, and talking about the crew, I mean, it's not like these guys have got, you know, proper ear defending. They've got their hands over their ears. There's the ventilation there. You need that to keep the the, 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 the because of the vacuum that's created when a gun is fired. The noise inside there, the, the, the fumes, the vapor. Um, it, it's not... It, it's not a it's not a great job to have uh, being inside those things trying to keep a rate of fire on those guns would be really really horrible just the smell and the the noise and you know you maybe you haven't got to do it for very long because it's just kind of a one one use situation but you know it's it's not a very nice job i mean there's no nice jobs no, there's, there's, a, there's a few things i mean the, the the noise most of the noise comes out the barrel so as long as the barrel's outside that reduces some of it okay but it's still going to be pretty loud inside Every time you open up to reload, you get fumes. But the other thing, if you're facing north, which that one is, you have no real idea what's going on behind you. 
um, or immediately to the side of you. Um, so, you know, by the time, if anyone does get close, by the time you see them, there's no real way of escaping, is there? So you oh, kind indeed. of, um, kill the sec. And we're kind of coming on that the weakness of the interlocking nature is that, 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 that these guys are protecting a bit of beach several miles up the coast and another bunker system somewhere south is protect, protecting the front of this one. So every set of defences is reliant on another commander of another set of defences doing his job. And if one, if, if one uh, link in the chain breaks, then the whole system starts falling apart. So it's clever, but it also is open to, vul to uh, 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 vulnerability as well. So Duncan's moving around the back now to yet another Tobruk there. And um, uh, that's another one that's just, you know, mortar to fire over the top. And the mortars are French. I'll bring up a photo of the French mortar. I hadn't done that earlier because there's a particular French type of mortar they're using here, um, which is five centimeter like the German ones, but different, different bombs, different spare parts, different um, loading procedures, different everything, different, you know, again, these headaches of what they're trying to do there. French, French mortars, German mortars, Czech guns, German guns a lot of things to uh, to deal with here. Um, and then the standard um, machine gun type of Tobruk, um, and the, the, most of the rear bunkers have a have a, a ring like that. Th that could be for anything, couldn't it, Sean, really? Well, yeah, it's like a concrete foxhole. So, I mean, they, they say the German term is uh, Stadtfeldmassig, which is like a, a strength in field position. So that's exactly what it is. It's like a foxhole for one or two men, but made of concrete rather than uh, just earth. And it gives you, let's say, a little bit more protection. So often you had, like I say, a skate mount, as you see there for a machine gun, um, um, like a metal ring, um, or, or just open, um, or just for observation even sometimes as well, rather than for any uh, any particular weapon. Yeah, and, and they had, uh, as, you, as Sean said, there are all sorts of levels of, um, of protection and cupolas and rings, and sometimes you just see them literally a machine gun stuck out on a bipod, don't you, with no attempt to kind of swing it around the tool. And as you say, sometimes just a guy with a pair of binoculars or a guy with a rifle. It's, it's when you're walking around these positions now, unless you were to sort of do archaeological evidence and find spent cases or something, it's very hard to say exactly what was in them because, you know, they're, they're, uh, you know we, have no, we know what was in the big ones, but... Um, for the smaller ones, it's harder. And the other thing this this uh, this type of bunker has on the side, it's also been built later by the look of it, is this extra little embra uh, embrasure on the side there for a, a, another weapon, I guess, a machine gun or something. And that has been, that's got a cold joint. That's a later addition, isn't it, Sean? And that's that's a little bit less common, isn't it? You don't see those quite as com uh, frequently in Normandy, do you? No, because they say it's non-standard. So um, it's just something which you, you, whoever was in charge on the ground at the time decided would be beneficial. There used to be, I think you can remember as well, there used to be the metal shutter was still there. It was, wasn't it? A few it? years yeah. ago. Um, but somehow and somebody managed to get it off. Um, but yeah, you know, it's just a, a little extra sort of protection for the, uh, for the big gun. Because while they're manning their, their, their cannon, you know, um, all sorts of things could be happening a lot closer up. So Actually, the, 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 the lighting has changed, but you can see the, the, the coast swinging around a bit there now, Duncan. You can see that sort of dark shape there on the horizon. That's where it swings round out towards uh, Sanvar, uh, La Hogue, and in fact, Barfleur. So if you look at a map of this on uh, afterwards, folks, you'll see that there's this position here has been located south of this nice bend in the, uh, uh, in the coast so that that one 7.5 centimeter gun can cover more coast. If Duncan swings round the other way, to face south again, you'll see where if they, if the gun had been pointing south of that position, it would have had less of a of a, of a tar, fewer targets firing south than by firing north, and that's why each V response desk has ideally as someone has come there like an architect and look, okay, which is the best view north, which is the best view south, where's the best access for the road, where's the best place to put the minefield, where's the best place to put, um, and we haven't talked about the flamethrowers yet, Sean. We'll, we'll come up with that in a minute. Um, and there's the view around this mag there filming and, and she's wearing my jacket because it was colder there than she was thought it was going to be um, showing back around there. I'll put on mags view again so mag can show where Duncan is. And that's the same bunker that Duncan's on top of now. But I'll put it back on Duncan's view again. So had the gun been firing south, so hold that view there, Duncan, you haven't got the bend of coast. But north, you've got the bend of the Sanval Og area. So some thought has got into how they've set these up. And um it, it hasn't worked because D-Day was successful, but you know you can see the, the method in their in their madness there. So let's talk about flamethrowers, Sean, because we haven't talked about that, have we? Nah. So um, more more to the sort of the southern end of the position, um, but also around the, the, the uh, a lot further north, you had these um, uh, automatic flamethrowers. So they're basically like a gas caster, 
that's exactly perfect. Um, so that'll be sunk into the ground. So the nozzle will be about a foot or so, so 30 centimeters uh, above ground level, uh, fired by a little electric charge, um, which shot a jet of flame across the floor. Um, and people, you know, welcome to France. Um, and uh, yeah, there were, there were a few of those dotted around the site as well. Um, nasty little things. Yeah, I mean, according to this, the Alan Chazette book, there was actually a, the, the, at one point at Reader's Snodless, I think that's photos from this position. There's, there's one of the actual control points there where you've got all the wires going out. Um, mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is I don't remember reading any account of these things operating, you know, any Allied soldiers coming up, particularly coming under fire from these things. I mean, they, you've only got to have one cable break from a bit of, anti, you know, a bit of gunfire and, and the system doesn't work. So I think it... I don't think they were, thank God, used very often, were they? <laughs> uh, they don't seem they don't seem to crop up very often, no, in, in terms of uh, accounts. Because I think they would, you know, if you were um, if you experienced them, I think you would comment on it. I think so. Yeah, coming under flame, I think you'd you'd mention that, wouldn't you? But yeah, for whatever reason, like down further south where the landings took place, the Goliath vehicles on the day, the cables seemed to not work. They'd broken. There was problems with electrics. Blah blah blah. Um, a, a lot of this stuff ends up not working quite as well as it's supposed to, which is just as well, really, because um, that's why we're all speaking English in, in France, uh, in Europe now and, and French rather than German. But um, there's a good view again from the top of those naval impacts there from the eight inch. And I'll say eight, eight inch this time, not eight centimeter from the from the cruisers there. And you can see how it's barely penetrated inside the concrete there. Most of the damage on that big casemate is, is sort of superficial, really, apart from what the sea is doing, which is is doing the most damage there. But um, there's various questions coming in on, on YouTube about Brian Yee said, with the cons of an interlocking pattern, in hindsight, could these defenses have utilized a better setup, in your opinion? Of course, the answer is yes. Of course, everything the Germans done did, they could have done better. Most of the things the Allies did, we could have done better as well. There's, there's inherent weaknesses in all of this stuff and the, the, the speed they're building it, the, the, the pressure they're under with supplies. Because by 44, Sean, explain a little bit about how little is coming through in terms of concrete and steel and new weaponry. I mean, all of these commanders have got orders in for the latest weapons and they're all being fobbed off. We'll get, you'll get them to you next week. And there is, they're never going to come now, are they? They're, 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 everything's snarled up. Well, no, I mean, you know, we look at now as Normandy has been, with hindsight, we know Normandy was the site of the invasion, but of course, you know, June the 5th, they weren't sure that was going to be the case. So um, the supply chain is prioritised. And uh, uh, if, if it's an area, I mean, the flooding, you can see the flat area there between um, the, the beach and the, and the higher ground. Um, some might suggest that that's enough of a deterrent to, um, to mean that, you know, um, this particular area isn't higher up on the priority list than it otherwise would have been. You know, the Allies wouldn't invade there because of the marshes. The marshes, the flooded marshes would do the job um, for the time being. Um, so, uh, and also you've still got the priority around ports. Um, by June 44, you've got, um, uh, another, um, the V-weapon sites up near Cherbourg, they're taking a lot of material uh, and the protection for those V-weapon sites as well has taken a lot of effort. Yeah. And um, I say, but we say with hindsight, we say, oh, why didn't they do this here in Normandy? It's because they were doing it, say, again, for three and a half thousand miles as well. Yeah. Um, I've just put up the image of this particular bunker that I've, I forgot to do early on. We can just see the barrel of the 7.5 centimeter gun coming out the front there. And you can see either Allied ships, well, that's part of the Gooseberry Harbor there. Um, and that's taken some time just after D-Day. That's from the Alan Chazette book there as well, which is quite nice. And you can see the peppering there of hits above the opening. And then there's this other photo, which again is not great quality. Some of these photos really aren't particularly good, but that's the same bunker there with, of course, part of the anti-tank wall that has, has either been covered over or we lost or salvaged and you've got some of the hedgehogs there but that's that same bunker there and you can see the embrasure the duncan was behind there a minute ago and um you know any any cursory look at these photos you realize how much the dunes have moved about in these last few years and and you can see that where that that single wall there is all one piece well now there's that split there where the the the, the water and the sea water has got inside there and but so it's constantly changing a dune like this and um had the, the invasion not been successful, I guess the Germans would have adapted to the movement of the dunes and carried on improving things and added more trenches. And, and the trenches, we didn't talk about the trenches because that's, again, that can be just simply a two foot down kind of dugout, or it can be like six foot deep with wood lining and have corrugated iron over the top. It depends what level the commander and the, has gone to to defend it. So a trench is, it can be anything um, within that. So, you know, we're, it's uh, it depends on what the, 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 
the, the defenders have been doing. But um, I'm just checking if there's any more questions coming in there because I don't think there's anything particular. I think people just are just kind of enjoying what we're doing, which is nice. But um, what other points did you want to get across about Avida Stones there, Sean? Because we're coming up, we're an hour now. So anything else you want to get across about how these things work and we haven't already covered? Um, no, it's just you, you put that little thing on Twitter, but um, the, uh, the survey about why it failed. Um, what was your uh, what was the result? Is it, have you well, there wasn't, the there wasn't a definitive, it was just that it did it fail? Was it did it do what it's supposed to do? It, you know, it's like when we did the well, Maginot line debate, and Paul Bristow, who was part of that, is watching it today. I mean, it's it's I was I was doing that for marketing reasons. You know, it was just a poll apparently yeah. asking a question gets gets good get res, better responses. But yeah, well, what what I was going to say was, what was the job of these guys here? Was to delay, wasn't it? Yeah. So did they fail? Well, not really. No. Uh, it, um, it could be argued that it was other people that failed rather than them. They held out till gone, but not quite midnight, uh, and then just kind of made their way further north. So uh, in that sense, I don't think it was necessarily uh, as, as a whole, of course, it fails. And, you know, thank goodness. Um, but, yeah, individually, um, the elements of it certainly prove their worth, I think. And that's and the reverse of that, of course, is when we talk about the Allied success and we say, it's it's no it's not one thing that brought about the Allied success. It's the it's the uh, the the deception campaign, the intelligence, the aerial photos, the aerial bombardment, the bombing of Germany, the resistance network, the 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 the, the paratroopers. It's all part of the victory. So the defeat the Germans suffered was as a result of all of the things um, playing their role. The Atlantic War played a role. Some parts held on longer than others. Some didn't. Uh, the German tank reserves, the use of that high, the, their 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 counterattacking forces, Hitler's own decision making, the German generals' decision making, the 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 multitude of weapons they're using, all these things are a factor. But you know, the 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 old adage that no 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 defensive position is ever held out indefinitely. They they always get breached. Every castle ends up being breached at some point. They you you can't keep people out. They'll find a way over round through uh, or, or or wait till you've gone or whatever that that, that no a, de a static defense can only do a certain good there but we'll just go back and through those who realign bunkers there again and just get an idea of how much this remember the route duncan is taking now back in 1942 43 he'd have been going through some kind of zigzagging um uh trench system and indeed back up near where the van the van is parked there looks like there even might be in a kind of a swamp area some evidence of kind of zigzag trenches back there it's hard to look at these days but Anyway, um, I think before the rain looks like it, the clouds have de definitely changed colour in the last last 20 minutes or so. So I think I'll let these good people get back to the van and get back home. Um, they went out with a hearty Woody's English breakfast before they went out. So they, they, they ate well. But there we are, folks. There is a kind of a guide to Avida Strong's Nest. We may well come back and uh, do more about... Uh, in fact, we're going to do something from Asville Battery at some point. We might do a day of programming from there at some point in the next few weeks or months. Um, Andy Jones just asked, how much was design and work driven by local commander versus the organization, Todd? And that's another big question. Yeah, there's the organization is sending down directives, but some commanders clearly, Sean, are better are more motivated than others, aren't they? It's like you get this. I think that is best illustrated by the um, the anti glider defenses. There's some cases it's like twigs just thrown in a wood in a field. Other times people have dug tree trunks in it. Your interpretation of orders can be can vary a lot, can't it, Sean? Yeah, and, and you say your motivation, uh, whether you see it as being totally futile or what. And there was a certain amount of um, um, flexibility. I think if you look at you know. The, lots of places that's what we said at the beginning of the show there isn't really a standard one because they've all no. been tweaked you know by, by you know the, by the, the local commanders according to their individual needs um so you know you have your standard structure but then they'll add this to it or add that to it or, or whatever um so yeah there was a there was a reasonable amount of flexibility within and that's why the, know, that's they, why the storage areas there they're going into the, the field for that one has been used by the farmer painted white it's got a wooden door on it which you wouldn't have had at the time um, and we'll come back at some point and talk about the construction. I mean, you can see what, anywhere where they've been today, you can see the, where the wood has left its um, grain in the formed concrete, the poured concrete there. And that's very much, folks, if you're visiting Normandy or anywhere, Atlantic Wall, the, the kind of easy way to tell the early bunkers and the late bunkers is the early ones, it's poured concrete with the wooden reset, the wooden grain showing and the later ones are the 44 kind of block techniques then you get others like le bouquet on omaha beach 
some of the bunkers there show both styles because it's kind of in the change. You can see clearly the grain of the wood there. Where the, and, and in fact, Sean, tell us, they were running out of wood, weren't they? They were simply running out of wood to, to, to use to pour the concrete into. Forget the concrete and the steel. Wood was in short supply. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's um, the, the whole resource thing is a bit mental when you think about it. You know, the amount of wood you would need, the amount of steel for rebar, you know, the, the sand, water, the gravel, the cement, everything to make the concrete, and then the resources to bring that stuff there. You know, it, it's, it's, it's the, the, the effort is, um, is phenomenal, really. And um, horse drawn. It, if Niels is watching, well, Niels, Niels will remind us. It's horse drawn as well, isn't it? And I mean, when yeah, we're talking yeah. about wood, it's not that the Germans haven't got wood. They've got plenty of wood in the Reichswald Forest. It's getting it to Normandy, that, and and the Calais is the kind of the trick now with the Ninth Air Force and Eighth Air Force and Bomber Command hammering all the railway lines and all the transport hubs, getting wood to the coast. And and I've done lots of concrete laying, and you cut the wood to fit for each thing. You can't easily reuse it on another bunker. But anyway, I think we'll bring it to end now. We've done a. Really, people have really enjoyed this, talking about this there. So there's the, the, the early bunk on the left, the, the later bunk on the right with the bitumen coating on there. And I think we've answered most people's questions there. And I'll let those two people go before the, the, um, the rain possibly sets in. So I'll put it back on all four of us again. So thank you very much, Sean. That was a, I mean, you and me, we can talk about bunkers anyway. We like talking about bunkers and, and Duncan and likes calling in them and Mag likes taking nice photos of them. So it's perfect. So for those watching, uh, we're doing a show tomorrow evening with Alan Allport, the author of A Britain at Bay and Browned Off and Bloody Minded, the British in World War II. That'll be good. There's Mag there. Um, and um, whether we'll do any more of these live streams this winter is all dependent on whether or not the weather is suitable because it's a, it's a, it's a balance for us guys watching in the advertise them early enough so you know we've got them coming up but also take advantage of the weather so we don't we can't set them up like two weeks in advance because if the weather's not good enough we're not going to do them it was lucky that we ended up being good enough today but there you are so thank you very short thank you very much sean that was brilliant thank you very much mag thank you, thank you very much uh duncan uh, thank you very much bentley and thank you very much people watching this is paul Woodad for world war ii tv saying i'll see you all again monday and uh mag i'll i'll see you soon and duncan i'll get the tick kettle on so Thank you very much for watching, folks. So we'll see you all again. Thank you very much. Bye.